Hello and welcome to In the Hyperloop. My name is Blake. Today we're going to talk about Hyperloop, loop tracks, tunnels, and tubes. But first, let's get into some of the policy. When we look at next generation infrastructure, examples that you can find are fast mobile communication networks, autonomous vehicles, e-bikes, and yes, Hyperloop pods, and boring company loops. We ask ourselves, where will these things go? How will they work with other forms of technology, transportation, and infrastructure already out there? Usually, the state government determines what is built, what is approved, and where it will be going. But due to increasing urbanization and older infrastructure, there arises increasing complexity of these interconnected infrastructures. The public requires national governments to increase the availability, accessibility, affordability, and acceptability of these infrastructures across the urban centers. So it may imply that the infrastructure requires alternate ways to ensure reliability and quality of these services. And some of these might be operated by the government, whereas some of them might be private sector through a public-private partnership. We know that Hyperloop as a utility fulfills most of the generation, transmission, distribution, and supply that is typically in a vertically integrated utility. But Hyperloop technology can reduce energy consumption, traffic congestion, and CO2 emissions. So there will need to be new modes of outreach and newly developed governance to cope with growing complexity of this new infrastructure. And the public needs to be involved with the government to require utilities like Hyperloop utilities to regulate and safeguard public values. So Hyperloop makes things really complex as it inherently is interconnected into larger networks of infrastructure. When these different infrastructures interact with each other, there are different time scales for both humans and for companies. And there's different levels of disruption from current and old infrastructure. We need to find out what are the emergent patterns of behavior from these Hyperloop systems. What shapes these behaviors and what results from the interaction between Hyperloop infrastructure and users? What happens when companies and governments use Hyperloop? What will be the changing functionality of a Hyperloop system in years ahead? Hyperloop will probably be a monopoly due to the high cop capital costs in the short term. This is simply because of the high sunk costs in developing the technology and the greater the path dependency on all of their proprietary Hyperloop technology. But new Hyperloop companies might change that. So if you're a Hyperloop company, you need investment. You need to be flexible. You need new technology that will ensure a now transportation of people, cargo, as a service. As perhaps regular observers of Hyperloop development, you need to remind yourself that Hyperloop infrastructure is not only a physical network, but in the future it will increasingly appear to be a distribution network, a carrier, a conversion and storage facilitator, and all of these need governance, both in their management and in their control systems. They need to be focused on its functional and social objectives in this governance. So the reality is that Hyperloop development can be fragile, especially when coupled with legacy systems and the changing demands and preferences of individual users and societies. Hyperloop infrastructure has yet to be fully tested for wear and tear. And we don't really know the failures that can happen you know, in a far away integrated infrastructure system or in a failure in another infrastructure system that Hyperloop is dependent upon like electrical or communication grids. Thus, we're gonna learn about the different decisions that current Hyperloop makers and actors uh, develop in their Hyperloop concepts. These Hyperloop companies are shaped by investors, regulators, owners, operators, policymakers, and yes, by all of us, the decentralized user. So you'll see different ways Hyperloop companies find ways to build test tracks, as many solutions can be adequate and adequacy 
is context dependent. So how will the future look like? What are these time horizons? Which technologies are most promising? Will Hyperloop be energy neutral? How will they make sure that Hyperloop meets new safety standards? How to ensure affordability in the short term and long term? What do you want to know about performance requirements given demographic and economic change? What data do these Hyperloop companies need to know? Well, let's start taking a look at their test tracks. Things are rapidly changing. And yesterday, Elon Musk tweeted out some news about The Boring Company. So first he tweeted out this Instagram video that shows the test tunnel in Hawthorne, California. I find it pretty interesting because it kind of curves a little bit more than I thought. And we see the um, Boring machine moving slowly in the frame. And uh, Elon Musk says, first Boring Company tunnel under LA almost done. Pending final regulatory approvals, we'll be offering free rides to the public in a few months. Super huge thanks to everyone that helped on this project. Strong support from public elected officials and regulators is crucial to its success. As mentioned in prior posts, once fully operational, demo system rides will be free. The system will always give priority to pods for pedestrians and cyclists for less than the cost of a bus ticket. That's really interesting because he's taken some heat in the past for that. So next he tweeted out that he's already started in DC and New York routes, hopefully start LA and San Francisco next year. That will be a true hyperloop with pressurized pods in near vacuum tunnels and faster than a jetliner. And then finally, cool thing about designing a hyperloop is that it's easy to incorporate branch loops and to serve small to mid-sized cities without slowing down the main loop at all. So now let's take a look at what's currently out there. So first is the granddaddy of them all, the SpaceX pod competition Hyperloop test track. It's approximately a mile long with a six foot um, diameter tube circumference. It's an aluminum subtrack with about 30 inches surface width and a central rail I-beam and concrete um, bottom fill bed. You know, six feet seems like a lot, but when you're near it, as you can see with these people, it's, it's actually not that big, but this thing really does stretch a long mile. It was built in 2016. Um, it can go down to low pressure, and of course it's right next to the SpaceX factory. It does take a little bit of pumping down. In these years past during pod competitions, it definitely took 15 to 30 minutes or more. The top speed record for this is a Tesla pusher vehicle um, at 220 miles per hour. Next, uh, of course, this just changed a little bit since Elon Musk tweeted, but there is the test track, right, or test tunnel in Hawthorne underneath uh, SpaceX property, but then they want to propose the 2.7 mile proof of concept tunnel in the city of Los Angeles to Culver City, and that will be 14 feet in diameter, which I believe is what this photo uh, shows. Regular air pressure right now, but of course, as Elon Musk said, um, perhaps low pressure for Hyperloop in the future. The skates that the Boring Company has showed will be traveling about 125 to 150 miles per hour, I guess in urban settings. And about eight, and these are in the tunnels in urban settings, um, but they do slow down. And eight to 16 people um, per minibus skate. Um, and of course it's focusing on pedestrians and cyclists uh, first, which is great. Future tunnels that are in the works is a bid between Chicago and Chicago O'Hare International Airport, as well as DC to Baltimore, and of course Elon Musk hints to New York City eventually, with multiple general access points, and those are the elevator that brings uh, vehicles up and down um, that was previously shown in a Boring Company video. So lots going on with this. Again, I don't exactly have numbers for the diameter, um, nor digging on the East Coast or their digs on the west coast or in Chicago, but definitely something to keep uh, attention to. Next is the Hyperloop One Dev Loop. It's 500 meters long and has a 3.3 meter in diameter tube. No publicly available guideway dimensions. The levitating chassis is on kind of the side and the braking I believe is in the middle I-beam. Um, of course it's about 40 or so miles away from uh, Las Vegas and Clark County, Nevada, and it was built in 2017. It does have a low pressure environment, but not a complete vacuum. And it takes about four hours, apparently, to bring the dev loop down to near vacuum, which is the 500 meters. 
but there's um, an airlock, as you see in this photo in the top right, that can reduce the air in a few minutes so they don't have to depressurize the whole system. And the current speed record publicly available is 240 miles an hour with one of their XP1 pods that you can see below. Next is Hyperloop TT. As you see in this photo, this is a huge tube, about apparently 13 feet or four meters in diameter. Um, they wanna build a test track that's uh, 1,050 feet long. And this test track is interesting because it's full scale. And I believe that's one of the few, if not the only in the world, um, both for cargo and passengers. They also plan a uh, test track that's on pylons that's about one kilometer long uh, and the pylons are about 20 feet tall. There will be a public unveiling of their facility in Toulouse, France um, that um, is where all these uh, tubes are going and they'll hopefully be showing more about their pod that is being built in Spain that will be going into these tubes. So Hart and Delft Hyperloop does have one section of tube that Delft Hyperloop uses to work on apparently for their pod competition as Delft Hyperloop. But Hart is also in this um, and played a, a role in getting this built on Delft University grounds. It's, it was built in 2017. It's about 30 meters long. Uh, 3.2 meters in diameter. They want to test pods in their safety, propulsion, gliding, stabilization, and they did receive some funding from the Dutch railway company NS. And Hart Hyperloop um, wants to build a test facility and has received government support. The government even did a uh, kind of a feasibility study which recommended that uh, they build, you know, the three, di three meter diameter tube that is three to five kilometers long and that will include curves, switches, passenger pods, safety, and uh, operation timetable built into the facility. So a lot more real world than you've seen um, with um, either uh, DevLoop or Boring Company perhaps. So very exciting. Now let's go to another European team, Hyperloop UPV. Its Hypertrack was officiated in October of 2017 at the University Polytechnique de Valencia. Hyperloop UPV team uses the 12 meter vacuum steel tube to apparently pass tests for the um, SpaceX pod competitions. And they built it um, as kind of a pod competition clone so they can test their uh, pod much more easily without going all the way to California. And it's a spiral welded steel tube just like the one in Hawthorne. And that's really exciting. And I just did an interview with Hyperloop PV to talk about project management, so you can check that out. Transpod does not currently have a physical test track, but they want to build a half-scale prototype um, pod and a two to three meter half-scale test track in R&D buildings on a former railway land that is owned by a city council um, in Limoges, central France. So the test track will allow pods to run as fast as 600 kilometers an hour. Tubes um, that are two meters in diameter uh, will be cr placed on concrete pylons. And there is currently an environmental impact investigation um, that is going on because it's private uh, land. And actually the Hyperloop TT group um, is building their test track on a former military base that excludes it from having an environmental impact survey. So it, I think two different <laughs> use cases in the same country, but the 2019 full-scale prototype is being planned uh, by Transpod, and that will be a six to 10 kilometer full-scale test track, possibly in Canada, but uh, we're still waiting for some news about that. That's about it, actually. <laughs> I, was, I was waiting for another one. Um, I'm sure we're gonna hear more from different Hyperloop groups uh, in Europe soon about the latest developments and stay in the loop and subscribe. So talk to you later.